Hi everybody and welcome back to Geezer Rider. This is more of a blog than a vlog, meaning it's not necessarily a video, as you can probably surmise by the lack of video content. Uh, it will be all audio. And rather than being viewed as a punishment, this is kind of a reward for those that have been following the channel and enjoy the content. And, uh, you know, as our new intro states has more than the attention span of a gnat, you know, or the mating cycle of a mayfly. So if you like detail, if you like content, um, stay tuned. If you're already bored, go ahead and abort, you know, abandon ship and get on with your life. Um, you're probably not going to get anything out of it otherwise. If you're somebody in it for the long haul, if you're into the details, if you're into the why and the what and the for how, um, you're in the right place and this is, you know, content that is is aimed at you so once again i thank you for listening i thank you for your patronage i thank you for liking the videos and for subscribing and for hitting the notification um, all of that helps us greatly in order to get the message out um, to promote motorcycling uh, for the variety of reasons which we stated in other videos on the channel so what this is intended to be is kind of a background of the geezer. So the progression through motorcycling isn't necessarily linear, but <clears throat> does seem to mimic the experience of others. So as you can imagine, you know, the given the age of the geezer, um, my experiences range through two-stroke, diesel, four-stroke, et cetera, over the years, just as far as combustion, you know, internal combustion is concerned. I have always had a fascination with Edison and Tesla, uh, specifically with Tesla um, over the years, not Tesla as the modern entity, but Tesla, Nikolai Tesla, the inventor um, and the father of everything that we know to be modern electronics. Um, Edison just kind of appropriated it as it went along. And in my mind, Edison was kind of a ma major douchebag, but and a brilliant marketer, uh, which is probably why Elon Musk actually admires Edison more than he um, admires Tesla, even though he named part of his companies after that inventor being Tesla. <clears throat> so, you know, you're, you're getting a quick sense of the diversity of my interests and the diversity of my experiences. So we're going to wind the clock way back into the 60s before color television, before space flight and on the age of jet propulsion aircraft, basically, you know, you know, just just on the precipice of that. And if you're already bored, dude, go find something else to do. You're going to continue to be bored for the next few minutes. Um, but if you're engaged, if you want an idea of the history and the progression of how somebody like me comes to be, you're in the right place. So here we go. So I had a um, paternal parental uh, influence who was directly involved. And I don't mean that in any uncertain way. I mean directly involved in the Apollo and Saturn <clears throat> and um, Gemini space programs. And um, that was major engineering. And their forefather was involved in engineering um, tanks for Chrysler during the war. Uh, and that was just within 14 or 15 years of walking off a rural farm in Iowa, or I'm sorry, Ohio. And his bride was uh, from similar upbringing, but of similar intellect and uh, also, you know, uh, contributed to the war effort in one way or another. And they were of higher education, but never lost their work ethic, their um, penchant and appreciation for hard work, um, or their understanding that knowledge was power. So you have somebody that is willing to work, but understands that there is value in finding a better way to go forward 
and also finding value in providing a more elegant solution to something that's already there or something that didn't exist, exist before. <clears throat> and that can be through better engineering or something that is there or just inventing something new, you know, or embracing new technology. So, you know, I went through um, the analog age. I was actually a repair person that um, repaired two vacuum tube TVs, appliances, radios, stereos, um, and progressed into solid state, got into miniaturization. I have extremely large hands um, by modern standpoints, and I was actually one of the few people able to, in my electronics repair area, um, to be able to work on the 1980s versions of Sony Walkman, Watchman type uh, devices, which were then advanced microelectronics, which required the ability to focus on extremely small uh, circuitry and, um, you know, just, just basically small, micro, almost microscopic minutia and repair things. So, you know, not, not just troubleshooting, um, taking, you know, voltage and frequency measurements, but actually being able to visually appreciate, you know, visual obstructions just to circuit boards, both single layer, multi layer, uh, and, and making those repairs. And uh, to this day, I still don't know how I managed to do that in my youth. You know, I look, I grasp very small screws in my hands today and just wonder how I did it in the past. And my hands are roughly the same size as they were at that time. Uh, I am not patting myself on the back or putting myself on a pedestal. I'm just trying to give you an idea of where I came from. So throughout that entire time, I had a almost unhealthy fascination with all things internal combustion, with all things electronic, and all things celestial. So, you know, what I mean by that, I would entertain space fact and space fiction almost within the same plane because there were a few who could provide absolute proof um, how to differentiate one for the other. And this led into, and here comes a divide and probably not uh, socially acceptable these days, but here came the divide between my um, religious upbringing and my scientific mindset where my penchant to question was met with because. And, um, you know, in some cases, I embrace religion become, because of it. And in some cases, I diverge from religion because of the responses. Um, but what I generally walked away from was you have two choices basically in life as you go forward. Good and bad, truth or lies, violence or compassion. And I think if you try to veer towards what your truth is perceived to be at the moment um, and keeping an open door there and always compassion, then you will, you will pave a better path forward for yourself and for others over the long term. And yes, there will be apologetic moments and yes, there will be times you go, what the hell was I even thinking? You know, I was so off base or, you know, what was everybody else thinking? You know, you know, there was this herd mentality and they were all completely wrong. Um, sometimes thinking you're the smallest, smartest man in the room doesn't make you insane. It makes you literally the smartest man in the room. And other times thinking you're the smartest man in the room where all other thought processes are divergent leads to the conclusion that you're the most ins insane man in the room at the moment. Um, and those are truths that are revealed over time. You know, hopefully they're revealed in near real, real time to help you forward uh, as quickly as possible in life. But sometimes they just take a while to pan out. And um, 
I'm here to tell you that it is not always a linear progression. So how does this all relate to motorcycling? For God's sake, I've been listening to this guy rant on for, you know, X number of minutes now. And, you know, what it was, any of this have to do with motorcycling. And, and I, I will tell you that from the time I was able to fire up a 1950s era four-stroke horizontal shaft hit and miss motor there was just something that provided peace about knowing that that spark was going to hit from time to time that crank was going to turn from time to time it was going to put out a quarter of horsepower from time to time and that could provide locomotion for a saw blade a washing machine or god forbid some locomotive action that would move something down a path forward a rail or a trail or you know whatever um, and moving forward from that i'm not sure that i honestly had a complete appreciation for what was going on scientifically but i had a general i generalized ideal of air spark and fuel and what ne was needed for air spark and fuel which means for spark i needed a magneto an alternator a battery for fuel i needed a carburetor an atomizer or something or a fuel injector and for um Everything else, you know, combustion, I needed compression, I needed valves or reeds that worked, etc. And I delved into mini bikes. You know, I think the first mini bike I had was a three and a half horsepower mini bike with a chain drive about, you know, not much more capable than running a grandfather clock and, you know, a giant sprocket on it. And I maybe could get, uh, eight, nine miles an hour out of it. But man, was I free. That that was just the best. I could hop on that thing and I could burn a quarter of gas, which at that time was probably 93 octane, was standard um, and leaded. And I could go out for an afternoon and I could just burn around through the forest. And man, I, I, I was just, I was the guy. I was just in my own mind and honestly the damn thing didn't even have a brake pedal on it not even a scrub brake a scrub brake is something where it's like a metal bar that just engages the tire and rubs against the tire to scrub off some speed um you know and and fast forward a little bit from that to a go-kart with maybe an eight horsepower modified engine on there and we're experimenting with changing the uh jetting or you know the fuel intake so i could put in aviation fuel or uh, um, uh, alcohol fuel and we had dual scrub brakes which means there was you know a piece of metal uh, rubbing against each rear tire to slow you down we had slightly articulated steering no suspension at that point and um just just bombing around and, and having a good time in the open parking lot we could find before the police would come and say, hey, you know, you're making people nervous. They're, you're not really making a ruckus. But they're just afraid you're going to hurt yourself. And honestly, I was probably a valid concern because helmets were expensive and uh, just deemed unnecessary at the time. This was far, far way before anybody thought about putting a, you know, a helmet on a kid who's riding a bicycle. So move through that and, you know, further education. And I will admit at this point to there are facets of my person that are on the border of several spectrums, which I won't delve into, um, some of which have been beneficial and some of which have been a detriment. And, you know, I, if I could set the time machine backwards, I probably would not uh, change anything because I learned quite a lot. You know, so there was, there was a part of me because of the way I socialized and the way I learned in a non-traditional fashion that I, you know, I was studying volumetric efficiencies of turbocharged environments 
back in the 70s when everything was four stro uh, two stroke and diesel um, you know I was studying that about four strokes and just deciding how you know what I would want to do in the future with a four stroke uh, vehicle should I ever have one and people are just looking at me like you're crazy what are you talking about you know putting twin turbo char chargers on a v6 and you know I was entertaining that stuff in the 70s and early 80s and um, what we now just take for granted was uh, poo-pooed upon or you know just talked as craziness back in the day um, and I would Working, uh, you know, the typical minimum wage job, you know, working in a pizza parlor, managed to scrape a, enough uh, money together to get myself a two-stroke uh, moped. And immediately upon getting hold of this thing, um, I realized two things. One was I never wanted to be geographically bound by vehicular transportation again, other than uh, public transportation. In other words, I wanted to be able to get around on my own. You know, I wanted to have a, um, a, a means of transportation that was under my ownership and my under control. And, you know, uh, the other thing was I realized immediately that the EPA was full of shit. And I used that uh, cuss word liberally. And I try and refrain. If you've been watching this channel for a while, you realize I try and refrain. But... You know, I have borne witness to personally and through like Hot Rod Magazine and other things where they have um, machine things, you know, blueprinted engines and stuff, and they've gotten better fuel economy and better emission standards out of it. But because they didn't have a catalytic converter, for example, they were failed. And I looked at two strikes the same way. You know, I, I managed to take a Motobacon uh moped and increase its performance by what three quarters of a horsepower time probably to the point where i could have me and my buddy on the back of it going up a, a 20 percent grade and still maintaining a 35 or 40 mile per hour speed limit um and not blowing a you know big puff of blue smoke and that may sound pretty preposterous these days and you know underperforming but in that time frame that that was quite a, a, an achievement and realized you know i was getting 75 80 miles per gallon out of that uh performance metric so um i realized early on also you know the ecology of things and that was you know what was something made of what did it take to bring it to bear into the market? What happened to it after it left the market, either when it was junked and went to the junkyard or how much of it could be recycled? And, you know, what was the, the longevity of it in the market? And the planned obsolescence component just sickens me even to this day that, you know, we went from a mindset in the 20s and 30s and the 40s, even into the 50s of you might buy this once, but if you ever bought it again, you'd buy the same thing again. Or if you ever re recommended anything, you would recommend the same thing because it built like a brick out house and it would last for the uh, forever. And instead of being willing to pay a premium for a quality product that would be forever, um, the manufacturer surmised that, well, maybe you'd be willing to pay the same amount three, four, five, six times for something that had to be replaced three, four, five, six times. And that's pretty much where we are to this day. And if you just take an honest step back and look in your mind at various manufacturers and stuff and how long you might realistically expect to keep a vehicle that you didn't lease, for example, um, what might you choose that you would expect to last 10 years? And I mean, give full service without degradation 10 years. And everything that doesn't meet that criteria falls under the criteria of planned obsolescence. Because let's face it, if the thing was going to last 
aftermarket vendors would fill in all the blanks for the technology components other than safety, other than the structural things or airbags or stuff like that, you know, but as far as lighting and, you know, audio and, and creature comforts, you know, the aftermarket would f willingly and m most timely step in and provide the, um, a solution to anything you were looking for. So planned obsolescence is not up for debate. It is a reality. So that was something that I also kept in my mind and something I, I put in the forefront of my mind as I bought things going forward. Um, sometimes pushed aside based on current need or current want and sometimes pushed to the forefront because I figured I would have to live with it for a while. So I've gotten a moped, I've had a couple of two-stroke dirt bikes, and I had a uh, German-engineered uh, import vehicle made in the early 70s, um, four-wheeled, you know, uh, Opel GT, poor man's Corvette as it's called, Google it. And that was actually my first car. And I also wound up rebuilding that thing from the ground up and realized a bunch of things from that. And one was German engineering isn't always what it's thought of. And Lucas Electrics is absolute crap and had to be completely rewired from the ground up. And that has remained true basically to this day. Um, and my background is, and as you probably gathered from me talking about, you know, working on consumer electronics in the past to military electronics, um, that is my background. So I have zero talents for anybody that takes shortcuts with, you know, electrics and Lucas certainly did. And that was one of the major drawbacks of that Opel GT. Um, but the vehicle provided a learning platform and it was my transition and at this point we're talking about the early 1980s where i went from book smarts to street smarts and buddy let me tell you there is a whole lot of difference i don't care if you are young old male female female whatever when you try to translate what somebody has written on the printed page to what is the reality you learn a lot of things quick and that is you should never throw out any nut or bolt you ever pull off something and you should always remember any nut or bolt you put on something because sometimes there just is no equivalent and that that damned opal was one uh you know and i love that vehicle i probably built four to five engines for that thing over the course of time and had uh at least two different transmissions in it and it, it was just the car I love to hate. Um, it, it, it vexed me to the day I got rid of it. Um, its demise was I got rear-ended by a Lincoln and pushed into the back of a not Datsun F10. And it was like a Bugs Bunny cartoon where the front and the rear was accordion. And the guy stuck in the middle was the punchline of the joke. And that was true even from an insurance uh, perspective. So... Um, that was the, the untimely demise of the Opal GT. And I really, uh, again, still really liked that vehicle, um, even though it wasn't everything that I thought it would be. But, um, you know, it got me from A to B on my own, uh, bought by my own dollar, and literally handcrafted back into life by my own uh, sweat and toil and you know even, even the fit and finish you know it was a uh, enamel paint job which is something most people haven't ever even heard of and when I got it it was oxidized it was pitted it had rust and there was a, a product on the market then which was basically a body compound but it was called Rust-Oleum Colorback and what it was basically was, was a, a polished wax with a mild compound agent in it. And if you just kept rubbing and rubbing and rubbing and reapplying it in the same spot, you would eventually get down to either bare, you know, the paint that was still left or bare metal. And I probably spent two weeks straight 
bringing that Opal GT back to a luster that nobody had seen in 20 years. And it was just amazing, just absolutely amazing. Um, of course, you know, the rust and the, the rocker rails and stuff persisted. So from there, I kept entertaining volumetric efficiency and things like that. And, you know, wondering about turbos and add-ons and power adds and power to weight ratios and starting to fall in love with um, more esoteric solutions like Lotus. Um, wasn't really thrilled with the idea of a car that was glued together at the time, you know, like Lotus was starting to entertain. Now we have jet liners that are held together by glue. Um, but, you know, I, I had that forward mindset the entire time. So I had the next vehicle with a couple of Toyotas in between, either familial or um, oh, my own purchase, which I tweaked and peaked and learned about hemispherical firing chambers and stuff. I had a Toyota SR5 hatchback um, with a 1.5, 1.6 liter hemispherical firing uh, motor that I, you know, tweaked a couple extra horsepower out of and did one of the earlier Japanese hot hatch conversions on. Um, very, very bleeding edge in the mid eighties at the time here on the mid Atlantic and the East coast, uh, was something that wasn't seen before. And the fact that I created, managed to create a decal that said Hemi on the front, just blew people's minds. And, uh, you know, it was, it was obviously a very much eighth mile, um, vehicle, you know, as far as performance was concerned, much more about handling. I lowered everything by about an inch, maybe two inches on all four corners and um, <clears throat> change some rims and tires and things like that. But, you know, from a horsepower perspective, nothing really changed, but, you know, it could just really stick through the corner. So I would pick up time there. Street line, not so much. Uh, after that, I got into Big American Muscle, uh, fell in love with Mopars. God help me, <laughs> God help us all. And, uh, couldn't afford to get into the 383 and the 440 and above uh, displacement range and was looking to tweak what I could out of a 340 or 360 and uh, managed to push a 340 Challenger pretty damn hard and uh, had a, quite a lot of fun uh, with it. And one thing I will point out here, folks, is I just never felt compelled to show my shit. You know, here I am cussing again, and I apologize. But, you know, gosh darn it, this does not belong in the street. The burnouts, you know, the, the drifting, the, the, the high speeds, none of it to, uh, belongs on the street. If you put yourself into a tree on a corner, that's on you. But you know what? The reality of it is that seldom happens where you just take yourself out. What more often happens is you're going through a turn and the minivan with a, a family of five in it is coming, oncoming, you know, in the opposite lane and you can't hold your corner and you take them out with you. So I would go to the local rural drag strip and, you know, embarrass myself with a, you know, 13 or 12 second ET. Um, for, you know, a relatively heavy in stock vehicle with all the seats in it and, you know, an eight speaker system in it. And I am an audiophile and a amplifier uh, advocate. Yeah, I, I like my music loud, which is probably what I'm hearing is crap right now. Um, but I like high fed audio. If you don't know what Macintosh audio is from Bingham, uh, New York, before um, somebody else, Clarion, <coughs> acquired them. Um, check them out and, uh, you know, review the history and you'll have a good idea of what true high fidelity audio really is. And, uh, you know, I, I would try and put that into my vehicles. And that Opal that I, you know, doubling back just a second, that Opal that I had, it, I probably put almost double what I paid for the purchase price of the vehicle into audio in that vehicle. And that was one of the reasons why it stood out whenever I went to a car show or anything. So 
you know, at this point, we're into the very early 80s. And, you know, I just uh, talked about muscle car area era and um, was trying to figure out, you know, what I was going to do. I transitioned from that to that uh, Toyota hatchback that I talked about a little bit earlier and was looking to make a move and realized, you know, I've, I'd moved out of my parents' house into an apartment and realized, you know, hey, getting all my crap from A to B is kind of expensive. You know, renting U-Hauls and stuff at the time uh, was, a, a, you know, there wasn't a task rabbit or anything like that back then. So yeah, I, I might want a little pickup truck. So I was torn between the Mazda B210 and the uh, Ford Ranger and the Chevy Love pickup and stuff like that. And basically, the Ford Ranger was a Mazda that was rebranded, but they did come out with a model that was a V6 fuel-injected, um, multi-port fuel-injected V6 with a five-speed manual transmission. And I was like, <coughs> I don't care who it's from, I'm there. And I bought it from Ford. And one of the things I realized, at least at that point in time, was that Ford wasn't necessarily the greatest in body and running gear, but they had kind of a nicer interior. And like buying a bed, you know, you might want to buy it a little more about how it sleeps than what it looks like. And with the Ford Ranger, it was a little bit more about how it felt while I was driving it than what it looked like or, you know, how the body would last. And I even moved a, a very major upright piano in the back of that sucker after, you know, and I had done some s suspension mods to it, uh, including airbags. But even before that, I think it really could have handled it. Uh, and I read that for a little while and I managed to do a few, you know, <coughs> tweaks and things to it to try and eke a little bit more horsepower out of it. And I drove that for years, even into my family life and, you know, my married life. And along the way, uh, my gal pal that I picked up and eventually married, um, was looking for a sedan and we picked up on a Ford Thunderbird Turbo Coupe. And basically what that was, was Ford's first endeavor into turbocharging a, what was then considered a midsize, what would nowadays be considered a full-size two-door sedan with a turbocharger. Unfortunately, they did it with a four-cylinder. So what did that mean? Uh, even though it was made into a five-speed manual transmission, it meant that when it was new from the factory, it ran like, it ran pretty well. Uh, even with all the EPA restrictive stuff on it. But after about five years, which is roughly around the time we acquired it, it had kind of fallen off the mark. So I had reignited my passion in volumetric efficiency and turbocharge and, you know, air fuel ratio dynamics and getting the most I could out of the performance of that thing and quickly realized a couple things. One was the turbo was half perished. The wastegate waste wasn't working correctly um, in that, not that it wasn't, you know, bleeding off excess boost, but it was bleeding off almost all boost. And uh, uh, my fiance and her father-in-law and I basically rebuilt the entire top end of that vehicle um, taking the the head off and having a machine that everything done. And um, I will tell you, to this day, there's probably no vehicle that I would rather take a long distance trip or like, you know, travel across East Coast to West Coast in than that vehicle. The, the seats were just that comfortable. The ride was that smooth. And I never felt starved for horsepower after all the work was done. Um, you know, going through a mountainous terrain, either uphill or downhill. Uh, it, it, was, it was just a blast to drive in, in, in all seasons. And it actually had fair foul weather traction, both wet, ice, and snow. You know, you could regulate things where it wasn't out of control. So from there, you know, we had, uh, dear Lord, Chevrolet Tahoe. We had 
Chevrolet Avalanche, we had a Pontiac Grand Prix, and double Mack to motorcycles. You're probably wondering when that was going to come up again. I had a uh, 1000cc, you know, uh, Honda Goldwing GL1000, um, which I, I put a uh, tour pack and saddlebags on. I forget the manufacturer now. It might come to me in a little bit. Um, they were um, secured via a cylindrical key mount, which you rotated about 20 times to rotate out a, uh, a screw into the retaining mechanism. Uh, and boy, that was the definition of freedom. I, you know, it's basically, it was a boxer uh, four, uh, much like BMWs, um, just crappier intake issues uh even for honda at the time and i could get on that thing and go for a couple of days on a tank of gas and you know pack a lot of crap in it and not worry about a whole lot you know or at least not much more issues that would come up than the tools that i could carry on the bike and and have a great time and i rode the absolute piss out of that thing both commuting uh, in all kinds of weather and on trips for a couple of years. Life gets in the way. You get married, you have a kid, or you have a pregnant wife. Um, there's a little break in things. And I was at a motorcycle show in Philadelphia, and there was a uh, Yamaha dealership out of Reading, Pennsylvania, that had a Yamaha Venture um, that they decided to set up outside one of the exits um, where they had done a color change. So what that means is it had come with a factory blue on it and there was like a, a gold bronze color combination um, plastics kit on uh, what the buyer wanted to buy, but they wanted a blue, so they exchanged it. So I wound up with, you know, the gold bronze colors on the Yamaha Venture that I bought uh, minus the, um, you know, high-end radio and all the other crap that came on the Venture Royale. Mine was just a Venture, <coughs> not a Venture Royale. But the V4 in it was basically a slightly detuned VMAX with all the extra weight. And buddy, let me tell you, that thing was a lot of fun. When you figured out the RPM range on that, you know, where the torque curve was, you could really get that thing going. Um, terminal velocity was a non-issue because the fairing was designed for aesthetics, not aerodynamics. and would actually uh, tend to lift the front end off the ground at like 80 or 90 miles per hour versus, you know, uh, put down force on the vehicle. So, and, and that's even riding two up, you know, it was just that poorly designed of a front end. But at normal highway speeds, it was a non-issue and the thing gripped great and went along really good. And I remember one time uh, coming home from West Virginia to basically like the southern New Jersey area uh, one time and I had a very finite amount of time to get where I was going and was really pushing the envelope and it was either late fall or early spring and there was a light snowfall and the thing gripped like it was on rails and people were just looking at me like I was crazy and they're probably half right you know I shouldn't have been pushing as hard as I was but the darn thing stuck you know, like glue onto the road, and I was thankful for it. And that's another good reason to keep your bike well maintained and keep good tires on it. So from there, you know, there's life comes along, you have a little break in life, and sometimes you go back to your roots. And I got a little 750 cruiser uh, after almost a 20 year hiatus, and you know, rode that around for 10 years. And uh, actually, after that, seemed to take a step backwards and bought my first Harley Davidson. And a lot of you right now are just like, 
what the hell's wrong with you? You know, you had a pretty good track record there. What are you going for? You had all these Japanese bikes in your youth and mini bikes and everything, and you know, all these reliable vehicles, and you went through a Harley. And all I can tell you is once you do it, you get it. And I don't mean you get it like, oh, you finally saw the light. It is a imperfect world. You know, when you get into a Harley, you're in an imperfect world. But if you are mechanically inclined and you had an engineer mindset and you like to make your a bike your own, chances are more than 75% of you are going to decide that you actually do like a Harley Davidson. And I can see a bunch of you, you know, just hitting the pause button or the stop on the video right now and starting to write negative comments and like you're full fluff and you don't know what you're talking about. But all I would encourage you to do is be, before you, you know, go ahead and do what you're going to do. I can't tell you what to do, but, you know, why don't you, you do a uh, weekend rental or something, you know, or a lease and try one out and see what it would take to make it your own and see if you come away with the same mindset when you're done. If you do, so be it. And if you don't, hey, you know, a world of opportunity just opened up for you. And I'm not here to tell you that, you know, the Harley is the BL end all, or I wish I had never stepped foot into that and I stuck with, you know, Honda and Yamaha and Suzuki or Kawasaki. You know, if something is bringing you happiness and enjoyment and you're cool with your investment, then that's good enough for me and hopefully it should be good enough for you. And you can appreciate and respect everybody else that's on the road. But all I would ask you is just don't knock it before you try it. Um, I don't have to ride down the road on a Harley, which is what I'm still currently riding with a wrench in my hand or a rag to wipe up grease, you know, or oil. Um, the, those days are kind of behind us. Um, and I really do enjoy it. And I won't say that my next bike will be a Harley or my next bike won't be a Harley. Um, or even if there will be a next bike. You know, there's a lot of things that I, I'm looking at right now. Uh, I'm probably more likely to have two or three bikes before I get rid of my last bike. And one of the things on my list is a Royal, Enf in, blah, 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 a Royal Enfield, which I never thought I would say because it's manufactured in India. But damn, you know, it's like the Japanese learning quality control and everything back in their day. Royal Enfield is going through that right now. And if you want to look for the value add, if you want to look for a vehicle that, you know, might go the distance going forward, you know, dollar for dollar, take a quick look at them and, and see if you don't land in the same place I'm looking at right now where, hey, somebody talk me out of this because I can't see a reason not to get into it. So, um, like I've said in a couple of videos, this is a, a kind of a stream of consciousness and I didn't want to detract with a lot of visuals which is why this is more of a blog than a vlog vlog but um you know this is kind of a get to know the creator type thing and you know where i came from and realized that this is encompassing almost six decades and i've left an awful lot of material out of this um because otherwise it would be even longer and what's already a very long audio content and you know, I'll, I'll allow you to get to know me, get to know my mindset about what my expectations are for quality and engineering, etc. And I would really appreciate your feedback. I like your comments, both positive and negative. If you think we've earned it, you know, please give us a like, give us the thumbs up. And by all means, you know, please subscribe if you want to, you know, see more of this and hit the notify if you want to uh, be made aware of when we put new content out. Thank you. Ride safe. Namaste.